Hey everyone, best wishes for a soul profiting great Lent as we approach uh, the beginning of Pure Week. I wish you a good uh, Sunday of forgiveness uh, and forgiveness Vespers this Sunday night. Before uh, I share with you my reflection, which I have entitled The Trumpet Call of Lent, The Trumpet Call of Lent, I want to tell you about a new series that we've just published at PNP. It is a superb series. Uh, entitled The Life and Teaching of St. Basil the Great. It's six lectures uh, by the patrologist Father Maximus Constus, uh, currently the Dean of Holy Cross Greek Orthodox School of Theology in Boston. If you just go to patristicnectar.org, you can find the new series there. I think you'll find these lectures to be absolutely penetrating, allowing you access uh, into uh, the heart and the life work of one of the three great holy hierarchs, St. Basil the Great. Father Maximus has taught this course uh, both at Hellenic College and at the seminary there uh, a number of times, and he recently gave these lectures to a, collect a collection of about 100 clergy. Uh, and uh, we have his blessing to publish these to the wider public. Enjoy, enjoy. The Trumpet Call of Great Lent. You know, in the scriptures, uh, in the Pentateuch, in the fourth book of Moses called Numbers, there is a description in chapter 10 of the use of silver trumpets in uh, the life of Israel uh, at the command of Moses. So the, the, the setting is that Israel is in the wilderness. Uh, they have recently been arranged, uh, the 12 tribes of Israel arranged in a pattern, three tribes before the ark, three tribes behind the ark, and three tribes on either side of the ark. Uh, and they, they're enthroned in the middle of the people was the tabernacle, the table, tabernacle, the uh, a tent of meeting where God dwelt in his Shekinah glory. Uh, and uh, the Ten Commandments, of course, were in the ark, right at the center of the life of the people of God. And every day, the pillar of cloud, this glory cloud of God, would rest upon the tent. And uh, God and Moses would commune and Moses would receive instruction. Sometimes the glory cloud would be there for a day and then it would move. And when it lifted and moved, the people would lift and move. Uh, if it remained there for a month, the people would remain there for a month or a year. It was uh, a, a catechetical pedagogical lesson to the people that their life, this journey through the wilderness, which we Christians also know as our life now, short of paradise, uh, is to be done always following God, always at his command, always according to his will. This is why we believers are constantly saying God's will, God's will. But that's just a universal orthodox uh, exclamation uh, throughout the world. Orthodox Christians simply say it. God's will. We're training ourselves by these holy words uh, to live as God was trying to train uh, the Israelites. And the silver trumpets were blown by the priests uh, to express the, that time and movement in the journey is according to God's divine command. And they had different types of blasts. Uh, a single blast would summon the congregation. Two blasts, maybe just the leaders. An alarm blast would guide the people to move in a certain direction. We, in the church today, we don't have uh, our silver trumpets, but we do have uh, the voice of God through the liturgical calendar. And we have been hearing the trumpet blast calling us to engage, to move into the journey of Lent. Uh, these trumpet blasts have been the liturgical Sundays that have preceded uh, these days. The gospel lessons of Zacchaeus and the publican and the Pharisee uh, and the prodigal son. And, and the Meet Fair Sunday of the Great Judgment last week, and then this, this week, Forgiveness Sunday. These are all preparations to orient us to uh, the great call to engage in Lent. Lent is 40 days long. It's essentially a tithe of the year. This is how the fathers of the church have taught us to think about it. These are holy days, and by committing ourselves wholeheartedly to spiritual engagement, over the course of this tithe of the year, it sanctifies the entire year. A Lent well spent uh, is a Lent in which we gather the grace of God that will sustain us in the wilderness of this life for the rest of the year. That's how much grace exists in Lent, and especially uh, in the week that follows Lent before Pascha in Holy Week. So drink deeply, brothers and sisters, and remember that Jesus is calling us to engage 
primarily in three things in Great Lent. Uh, first, in prayer, next, in fasting, and third, in almsgiving. This, of course, uh, these three are the core of our spiritual practices as found in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus simply presumes that his followers are engaged in these. Uh, but we raise our commitment to prayer, fasting, and almsgiving to a much greater height and take a much more serious disposition towards prayer, fasting, and almsgiving in Great Lent. What is prayer? What is prayer? Prayer is to draw near to God. Prayer is the human being stretching out his hands into, uh, to embrace God, to be near God. And we're encouraged to do so by the Lord himself, who has inspired in Scripture these words, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. This is the potential of Lent, is that for every effort that we make, God also makes an effort, and a greater effort, to be near us and to commune with us. St. Theophan the Recluse, he says, prayer is to, have, to stand before God with our mind in our heart and to go on standing there until our last breath. That is a, a, an incredible goal for Lent, to draw near to God, to try to bring our mind to him, to settle our mind in our heart and stand before his presence and to go on standing there, being with God and God being with us. So I encourage you, dear ones, to engage in prayer and ask yourself this question, what personal prayer will I commit to? What uh, deeper personal prayer will I commit to during Great Lent? Perhaps you will take up your prayer rope and use your rope more enthusiastically. Why not commit yourself uh, if you don't have the discipline of having uh, the prayer rope and using the Jesus prayer at the end of your daily prayer rule? Why not commit yourself to saying a hundred knots as the last thing in your morning prayer rule, such that you go into your day in the morning with the prayer of Jesus on your lips uh, as an effort to try to stay with him. That's the prayer that we try to keep going uh, throughout the day. And when we find ourselves empty and that terrible secular sacred distinction has made its ugly face apparent in our life by our forgetting to pray, we can pick up our rope and pick up just where we left off and say the precious name of Jesus and call out to him and immediately end that gap by joining ourselves to God. This is just one suggestion. Uh, there are many other opportunities for you to develop your personal prayer, but this is one. And what about corporate prayer? How will you commit yourself uniquely in Lent to being in the church? You know, we have services every single day. We have the beautiful Lenten Vespers, we have the Great Compline, we have the Liturgy of the Pre-Sanctified Gifts, we have the Akathist Hymn to the Mother of God. These incredible uh, services, remember, they're not prayed by the clergy and the chanters for the chairs. They're not offered for the marble floors. Uh, these services are prayed for the people of God. Our churches ought to be packed uh, in Great Lent as we lay aside earthly cares and attend to the salvation of our souls. What corporate services will you yourself uh, embrace? What, what will you commit yourself? Think about it. Think about it and commit yourself for the course of Lent to participate in the services. If you can't go to all of them, pick some that you can go to, what you will go to. And how about fasting? How about fasting? Will you try this year to humble yourself and to be obedient uh, children of God to the call of the church, to follow the fast of the church. If you have never done that, this is the year to start. You don't know what is in store for you uh, by embracing fasting in a serious way, in a faithful way. Sometimes we talk about keeping the fast of the church as though that's strict fasting. That's not strict fasting. That's, that's just being faithful. That's just being faithful. Strict fasting is things that the monks do. Uh, where there's very limited eating at all. Keeping the church's fast, abstaining from the four categories of flesh meats and fish products, dairy products, and wine and oil, Monday through Friday. Uh, that, together with a reduction, maybe you could do 50% volume reduction instead of eating three meals a day with snacks, try to eat a meal and a half, something like that. That's not strict, that's not strict. That's just trying to be faithful. That's just trying to be faithful. Why not have an expectation 
and remember all of the incredible promises that God makes to those who fast. You know, it's impossible to follow Jesus even one little bit, to take one step behind our Savior, unless we heed his words that if anyone wants to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Fasting is a good test if we're willing even in a little bit to deny ourselves and have some expectation. When we lay aside our dependence on eating dead animals and plants to give us a, a short bit of energy to continue on, we're doing that not so that we're empty. We're doing that so that we can turn from our attention to food and our expenditures upon food to the Word of God, to being near God. Jesus says, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. We stop eating dead animals so that we can attend to eating the Word of God, which gives us not temporary energy, but eternal life. This is what God has to give for us, something much better. A greater, more royal feast is what is in store for those who are fasting. And remember that fasting and prayer receive their power. Uh, fasting receives its, uh, its energy uh, and, and its pleasing nature before God when we combine our fasting with almsgiving. And Lent is calling us. The trumpets of the church are blowing to call us to not embrace not just prayer and fasting, but also almsgiving. This is what turns our attention outward. If we just prayed and we just fasted, we could be accused of being self-focused on our own souls. But the Lord is calling us to pray and fast for the benefit of our neighbor, for those who live with us and those who live near us. Almsgiving is enabled and empowered by fasting. By refusing to... Uh, spend all of our money on ourselves by saving a lot of money by not eating delicacies by not having our our wine that we like not having our dessert that we like eating simple foods cooking large amounts of one thing and eating it for sustenance and not to please our palates we save so much money that we're then no matter what our income is no matter if we have disposable income or not outside of lent in lent we all have disposable income by embracing fasting and that is what the kind of fast is that pleases God is to free captives and to give encouragement to those who are downtrodden, which we can do if we cultivate our time and our funds uh, through prayer and fasting so that we can benefit others. Who will you visit this land? Who will you encourage? Who will you call? Who will you lift up? Who will you show hospitality to? Who could come over in great land and taste love, the love of a family that, that loves God and breathe some fresh air in a Christian home. These are the, the fundamental core of these disciplines of our great Lent. And in our time, in our time in which the culture is just uh, on a fast pace, pace to destruction, it's very important for us to reestablish our identity, to return uh, to the wilderness, to hear the readings from Genesis and Exodus and Proverbs, the basic catechal, catechetical readings that uh, are so traditional in the church during Lent, to hear those again, to return symbolically to the realm of catechumens and to stand with those who are preparing for holy baptism, and ourselves to renew our covenant vows with God, uh, th this is what's in store for us uh, in Lent and the celebration of Holy Pascha. I wish you all a very, very fruitful uh, Great Lent do this, do this because it's a tremendous way to remain gods uh, when the culture is pulling us away. I'll end with uh, this thought that I, I had last night as I was contemplating some news that I heard. You know, I grew up when I was young visiting the Midwest. I, my grandparents on my maternal side uh, were Missourians and I would spend uh, time with my sister and my cousins uh, in Northeast Missouri as a young man and as a young child. And I remember a number of the beautiful customs uh, that existed there that even at that time didn't exist in, in my life in Southern California. One of those customs was the tremendous respect that, that towns would show uh, to funeral processions and to the dead. I remember many times as a young boy being in uh, my grandfather's car and uh, a funeral procession would be approaching and he would pull over. We would pull over we would uh, bow, we would say a prayer for, for the family uh, that was going by. And that's what everyone did. You know, in California today, uh, in, these, in these last decades, uh, when we have funeral processions from the church to the cemetery, 
It's almost impossible to keep our funeral processions together because of all the disrespect that's shown by, by cars zooming in and out of the funeral line, cutting off the hearse, getting in front of people because there's just no respect for the dead and there is no culture of uh, honor, of no of honor. Last night, however, this uh, degradation, this fallen culture really uh, led to a new uh, depth, new depth. I was so saddened to see that um, at a Trisagion in one of our churches here in Southern California last evening, uh, the mortician pulled up in the hearse and went to open the church doors. And while he was going to do that, uh, a thief got in the hearse and stole the hearse with our uh, beloved deceased in it. And the uh, sheriffs had to issue a bulletin asking the thief to please return the body. I haven't heard yet if that has been success, if the person has been successfully recovered or not. But can you imagine? I, I just couldn't imagine a more uh, grievous uh, expression of uh, disrespect for the dead than that. But this is where we are, brothers and sisters. This is where we are. And for us, uh, it's an opportunity to shine our witness. Let us not be infected by the worst of all viruses, which is not the coronavirus. It's the virus of sin and the disregard of God. Let us not be infected by that. Let's instead draw near to the Lord God, the fountain of life, this holy land, and let us taste uh, how good the Lord is. God be with you. Thank you for watching this video. Do you know that PNP is recording the lives of the saints for every day of the year? It's a massive project and we're halfway done and we need donors to help us complete the project. Would you consider making a donation on our website today? Thank you and God be with you.